Take your Bibles, open up to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, the scripture reading this morning is where we're going to be. I'm not going to be reading as much, but I'll be adding one verse that wasn't read. Uh, John chapter 12, if you are using a pew Bible, you open up to page 845, that's where we're going to be parked today, John chapter 12, remind you as well, if you don't have a Bible, take that pew Bible home, use it, read it. I was telling the kids yesterday, I asked them how many have seen a Bible before, the majority of them had, and then I said, you know, tell your parents to read it to you when you get home, and put all the parents on the spot, so you take yours and read it. I also asked them how many of their parents got caught speeding too. So I love we're, I love working with kids. They're fun. You know. We had a couple honest kids. It was great. And then others that I was like, I need to talk to the parents. That kid's too scared. All right. John chapter 12. And I want to start by reading verses 12 through 19, because that's where we're going to park this morning. John chapter 12, verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast, heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you're gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this uh, familiar story for many of us, this familiar account. Um, We know it is true, and we want to understand it. So I ask you would guide us this morning as we look at the triumphal entry, as it's called, the Palm Sunday celebration in John chapter 12. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All around the world today, Christendom is, is celebrating Palm Sunday. I mean, that's what... Uh, people are doing, as it's designated that way because of verse 13, right? They took palm branches. And so, actually, a lot of churches take palm branches. Uh, In this area, they got to be fake, right? We don't have real palm branches. And wave them around, do whatever, uh, to celebrate whatever tradition it is that their church might do. Here they are meeting Jesus on the way to Jerusalem with palm branches and waving them before the Lord. What's sad is that so much of Christendom that probably at least participates in some sense of celebration of Palm Sunday, so much of Christendom probably has no idea what that day was about, and even really who Jesus is, something that they're celebrating through whatever church ritual and really don't understand fully who Jesus is, which is, by the way, that is John's main goal in writing this passage in recording Palm Sunday for each one of us. Each gospel, if you were to look at all the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all record this triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus Christ. They all have uh, certain things that they include and certain things that they don't include when they're writing it. John writes his accounts in John chapter 12 for a specific reason, including specific things for us. For John, we know exactly what he's trying to accomplish for each one of us as we look at this text today because John tells us why he wrote this gospel in the first place. In John chapter 20, verse 30 through 31, here is the point of the book of John. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which were not written in this book, but these are written. Here it is. Why is this written? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Notice what he says. What he has written down for us has a purpose, and that purpose in that verse is really twofold. First, that you and I would truly understand and believe who Jesus is. 
that he is the Christ. Many times you think of the word Christ as his last name or his surname. That's not the case. Christ means Messiah, the anointed one. That you would understand that Jesus is the Messiah. He was the Messiah and is the Messiah. He's the anointed one. He's the one who was promised long ago, all the way back even to the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, after man fell, the one who would come and crush sin, death, and the work of the devil. And not only that, notice he says, not only that you'd believe that Jesus is the Christ, but that you would also believe that he is the Son of God, making himself equal with the Father. As Jesus said in John chapter 10, I and the Father are one. So John wrote the account in front of us because he wants us to understand and truly believe exactly who Jesus really is. And then also, if you look at the verses up on the screen, there's another part to that. There's another purpose to that. He wants you to understand about Jesus and who Jesus is. But secondly, that by truly believing this, which is not just an intellectual understanding, it's not just rote data that you can give back, but a belief, a true belief that understands who Jesus truly is and lives in light of that belief, by following and truly believing him, what does he say? That you'll have life in his name. That you will have true life. This is an evangelistic book, wanting you to know who Jesus is and to believe in Jesus. And that is the purpose of our narrative today in John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. He wants to help us understand who Jesus is and believe in him. To say that people misunderstand Jesus today is, well, that's an understatement. People have all sorts of notions about who Jesus is and what he did. And probably even many people that are going to church today, which they normally wouldn't find themselves doing, but because of the time of the year, doing some type of Palm Celebration Sunday across the globe, they probably, many of them, unfortunately, may not understand who Jesus is. Whatever we're going to believe about Jesus has to be driven by this, okay? has to be driven by the Word of God and the Scriptures that was given to us so that we have a truly biblical understanding of who Jesus is for who he really is rather than a reflection of what we want him to be, which is how we all are if we're not careful. So what I want to do with this morning with our passage that's before us is learn about Jesus in a story that probably most in here have heard and know something about. In some form or another. You may remember, you know, the old flannel graph when you were younger. They would have palm branches. Others of you actually had, we had palm branches one time in here, one, you know, not too long ago. Um, then the kids just kept playing with it the whole time. And then it became a, a moment of testing for the parents. You know, am I going to care more about my reputation as a parent? Or, anyways, that's for another day. <clears throat> what I want to do is just look at this, look at this story, look at the characters in this story, because there's plenty of characters who did not understand who Jesus was and what was going on. Actually, even if you look at verse 16, the disciples didn't fully understand everything that was taking place before them. So we're going to just work through this account, and I'm going to tell you the story, as it were, with some added commentary so we can understand what's going on. So let's start off with the first major scene. That's verses 12 through 13. The crowd welcomes Jesus. Look at verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So, verse 13, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Now look at verse 12, right at the beginning. The next day. This is how we know it was on Sunday. This is how we know is what we currently call Palm Sunday. You read earlier in the scripture reading, chapter 12, verse 1, six days before the Passover, these things are taking place. Jesus arrives in a city called Bethany, which is about two miles southeast of Jerusalem. It seems to be a place Whenever he went to Jerusalem, he would stay there. That was the city he would be in. And it, and it was, uh, you know, down the Kidron Valley, up the, 
the, uh, around the Mount of Olives type of thing. And so he would probably stay from what we can see from the scriptures with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. You're familiar with them if you've ever read the book of John. Uh, that's where he finds himself at the beginning of chapter 12 when this event took place, took place at Mary's anointing Jesus' feet. So now in verse 12, we're in the next day. Now, just for perspective, just so you could understand what was taking place, Jerusalem at that time was about 20 to 30,000 people lived there, which means it's about twice the size of the city of Butler. Okay, that gives you a a rough estimate of what it was like back then. But during Passover, the estimates are that there were about 150,000 people that would descend upon totally that area of Jerusalem. So imagine 150,000 people finding their way into a city that was normally 20 to 30,000 people. There are people everywhere, all week long, coming from all over the Roman Empire. And they're here to celebrate Passover. John points out, in verse 12, that the crowd had come to the feast. There's a rumor that had gone around. They heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Jesus now is ready to make his way from Bethany into Jerusalem. And he calls it, look at verse 12, a large crowd. It's a large crowd, which makes sense because you had so many people, right? And the buzz is going around and people are talking, et cetera, et cetera. Why do they come out in verse number 13 to greet Jesus? Why are they coming out to do this? Well, look at verse 18. The reason, anytime you have that, that usually tells you a reason, right? The reason why the crowd went out to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. What sign? Look at verse 17. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb. That's the sign. And raised him from the dead, continued to bear witness. This crowd had heard what Jesus had done that he had raised Lazarus from the dead. You have that if you just kind of flip back a page and look at your headings. Chapter 11, what is that? The death of Lazarus and the raising of Lazarus. They had heard about this miraculous feat, you could say, that Jesus had accomplished. The last time that Jesus was in Bethany, he had raised someone who is dead and brought him to life. A man who is dead for four days, meaning he's dead. Like there's no other way to say he's dead. He is dead. It's a miracle, which we're so used to hearing. But I guarantee you, if somebody raised from the dead today, you would be pretty excited, scared, wondering what's going on. We don't see that. We don't, but we're used to hearing about it. So we just like, yeah, yeah, say somebody rose from the dead. But somebody rose from the dead. And it had captured them. So Jesus is making his way back. Wait a minute, isn't that the guy that... He's coming in, oh, that brought somebody, yeah, he really did this. So, of course, people wanted to see him. I mean, you guys get excited. Some of you get starstruck, you know. You hear like a a fame, you don't know what that means. Okay, so let me explain what starstruck is. So many blank faces today. I get it. It's, you know, it's sunny. We want to be outside. (laughs) Starstruck, you know, if you hear, my wife gets starstruck. I love my wife. Um, when we used to live in California, there was lots of stars that lived all around. I remember, and for her, when a star showed up, her blood got pumping. She was excited to go meet. And I'm like, leave them alone. They just want to sit and eat. They're normal. He, he's, he can act. Big whoop. You know? But we get excited. We get, you know, with something little like that. But, of course, they're excited. They're excited to see Jesus for what he has done in this great miracle. Look at verse 13. It's not only they were excited to see Jesus, they had actually drawn a conclusion about this one who had performed this great miracle. Look at verse 13. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. They not only were excited about Jesus, but they had now made some conclusions, you might say. They had put in their minds Uh, this and this and this together and started to think, 
hmm, I wonder who this person really is. And there's a couple of things in verse 13 that bring that out. First, notice, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. There are plenty of palm trees even today in Jerusalem, but actually not too far from there was a a, a city of Jericho, which was known as the city of palms. But why are they bringing out palm trees? Is it like, that seems random. Are they just randomly grabbing palm trees and going out? Why are they doing that? Well, palm trees in particular, I appreciate what one commentator, uh, Beasley Murray, says, were a sign of homage to their political deliverer. They understood in their minds that Jesus was coming to release us as a political deliverer. Actually, just over 100 years earlier, a famous guy, Judas Maccabeus, he ousted the Syrians from the temple, and the response of the people was almost identical. They brought out palm branches to celebrate this deliverance that had taken place of the Syrians over them. Just a few years later, his brother took over Jerusalem carrying palm branches. And later, in case you don't get the point yet, they actually minted their coins with palm branches to show Jewish nationalism. It was a symbol of a political deliverer. They came out and recognized in their mind, this guy is coming into Jerusalem to deliver us from, at this time, the Romans. He's our political deliverer. And that's why they're coming out with palm branches. They thought he was the Messiah, but a little bit different than the nature of the Messiah, as Jesus really was. He's their political deliverer. Look at what they're clearing out further. You can, this comes out even more in verse 13. So they take these palm branches. They went out to meet him, crying out, end of verse 13, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Hosanna, which means save now we pray. It was a sign of saying they would use that word Hosanna to speak of God's deliverance. And so they're crying it out to Jesus because they think he's coming to deliver them, I would argue, from the Romans. Because even look at the end of verse number 13. They quote, as uh, Zach pointed out, Psalm 118, verse 25. But they add a phrase you're not going to find in Psalm 118 in verse 25. Psalm 118, it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they added, even the king of Israel. So they're looking at Jesus who's making his way into Jerusalem. And they're thinking, he's the one. He's the king. He really is the king of Israel. Who else could raise anyone from the dead? He's got to be the one who's going to take off this Roman oppression that we are experiencing. So they understood Jesus to be this king to defeat their enemy. But boy, are they going to be surprised by the end of the week. That's the first scene. Verses 12 to 13. And notice verses 14 through 16. It's the second scene of what takes place. My, my outline's are real original. Jesus enters on a donkey. That's what's happening in verse number 14 through 16. One would expect a king to enter on a noble steed, right? But not Jesus. Jesus finds a young donkey and enters the city. The other gospels tell us that he had already prearranged this, and he had his disciples go ahead and grab that donkey. But it was very important that he went out on a donkey for the reason brought out in verse 15. So look at verse 14. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. Here's why he came in a donkey. Verse 15, just as this is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Jesus is entering the city here on a donkey, just as this is written in the Old Testament. And he quotes there in verse 15, Zechariah chapter 9 in verse 9, which says this, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. In Zechariah chapter 9, I'm not going to take you back there, but, but in, that, in that whole chapter, Zechariah is predicting the great conquest of, of Alexander the Great. He's chronicling all the defeat of Israel's foes through that chapter. And then he looks forward to the day when the Messiah is going to come to Jerusalem. 
He's going to enter on a donkey, bringing salvation to the people. The salvation, as you look at verses 10 and 11, would be marked by peace as the Messiah brings peace to Jerusalem. But what's interesting is, if you look at the screen and the verse there and then look back in your Bible, you should notice there's a bit of a difference right at the beginning. Look at verse 15. It doesn't say rejoice, does it, in your Bible? It says fear not, not rejoice. They're completely unrelated in Greek. There's many different opinions. Why does John put in verse 15, fear not instead of rejoice? But I think, I think, and other scholars who are way smarter than I, so I agree with them, that he's saying this because the way that Jesus is going to bring peace is a little bit different than their expectation, what they read in Zechariah chapter 9. When Jesus brings peace, it is not through the killing of his enemies, but through the killing of himself. And they did not need to fear for that. I mean, just a few chapters later in chapter 18, Jesus is in quite a different situation. And no longer will a crowd be crying Hosanna, but a different crowd, probably a different crowd at that time, is going to be crying what? Crucify him. Crucify him. Completely opposite the expectation of the Jews that you had in verses 12 and 13. Here they're yelling out, he's the king of Israel, and by the end of the week, he will be dead. So, of course, they cannot fear. You should not fear in verse 15. But that does not mean that he is not the Messiah or that he does not bring peace. It was just different from what they expected. He brought, arguably, the most important peace, the peace that we need with God. As Paul tells us what took place on Good Friday in Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, when Jesus died on the cross, he said, And through him, that is Christ, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace. How? By the blood of his cross. His death made peace with God possible, which, of course, every person alive needs peace with God because every person who is born into this world is an enmity with God because of our sin, because we are our sin nature, which is passed down to us from Adam. So Christ, as he enters Jerusalem here on a donkey even, is symbolizing the peace that he would bring as he fulfills the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. But the fulfillment of his peace would be different. We're still waiting, actually, for chapter 9, verse 10 of Zechariah the second coming of Christ. But now he would bring peace through his death so that all who would believe in his name might have peace with God through his shed blood. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, what happens? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The crowd anticipated a political deliverer, and here Jesus enters into Jerusalem, not on a mighty horse, but a humble donkey in verse number 14, bringing peace to the city, but in a way that they never would have expected it. And even the disciples didn't understand this. Look at verse 16. They didn't even put all these pieces together. They saw what was taking place, but they did not fully grasp what was taking place until Jesus had been glorified back up to the place with the Father in heaven. So verse 16, his disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. Then they remembered this event, and then they remembered Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, that this was a fulfillment of that. Now, the reason for that is explained, actually, to us in the book of John, John chapter 14 through 16, which I'd encourage you to read through this week as we focus in on the Passion Week. That's what's taking place on that last night. But he reminds us in John 14, verse 26, Jesus told them, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. You need to be taught by the Holy Spirit, is what he's saying. And the Holy Spirit's going to teach you the significance of, of the triumphal entry. That's a major theme, by the way, throughout the book of John, the necessity of the Holy Spirit. 
That's what uh, Sergei was preaching from in John chapter 3 in February. We need the Spirit to really, truly understand spiritual things, especially in the book of John, the significance and purpose and, and person of Jesus Christ. So that's why the disciples didn't fully understand it at first, and, and maybe why some of you have a hard, hard time understanding who Jesus is. You need the Spirit of God in you. Let me encourage you to, to ask the Lord to open up your eyes to see Jesus as you reflect on him this week. So, verse 12 and 13, the crowd shows up. They show up with palm branches. They proclaim Hosanna. They're expecting this political deliverer. And uh, Jesus shows up, but he's not on a noble steed. He's on a donkey, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. He is going to bring peace, just not in the way that they expected. Well, now in the final three verses, you actually have three different groups of people mentioned. And their responses, in a sense, to what's taking place as he summarizes this whole narrative. And just to remind you, this is the living, breathing word of God. When the disciples, and in this case, you have John and the apostles and the prophets writing the New Testament, when you come to the Gospels, the writer wants you to engage with the story in front of you. It's just not raw data for you to nod your head in agreement. Actually, the writers want you to really think of one of the things you should do when you read through the Gospels is ask, now, who am I in this story? Hint, by the way, you're never Jesus, okay? So... If you make that conclusion, come in my office. We'll have a discussion about how to read the Gospels. It's never the case. But you should be asking, where would I be in that crowd? Who would I be among those that I'm hearing from here? And as we look through these three different responses, I'm going to ask you, which one of these are you? And we're going to take them in reverse order. Notice the responses to Jesus in verses 17 through 19, starting in verse number 19, what I call the hostile, the hostile. That's the Pharisees, verse 19. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you're gaining nothing. They're saying this to each other. They're, they're, uh, I was going to say a word, but I know it wasn't a word. You all make fun of me. Uh, Exacerbated, maybe is the word. They're shocked at what's taking place here. You see that you're gaining nothing to one another. Look, the world has gone after them. You can see them talking to one another. Look at this. Look what's taking place. This guy isn't getting less powerful. He's getting more powerful. So they're saying this in frustration, and they're saying this in astonishment. They are not happy with the situation. They do not seem to be winning at all. As a matter of fact, it seems like if they point this out in verse 90, the whole world seems to be going after this guy, which for them, by the way, most of the known world was in Jerusalem at that time celebrating the Passover, at least people representing different parts of the world. But there was surely a tinge of irony that John detected in what they said. Because it's not just the Jews that are coming looking for Jesus. He actually starts off, which is the next major point. Look at verse 20, his next narrative. He's showing you, yeah, the whole world is going to see Jesus. Because who comes seeking Jesus in verse 20? Non-Jews, Greeks. So there's even some irony within this statement. But look what Jesus says a little bit later in verse 27. Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, for this very purpose. I have come to this hour. Verse 28, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there heard it, said it thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of the world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And notice verse 32, all the world is going to him. Verse 32, And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. All people, all sorts of people are going to find their way to Jesus, not just the Jews. Greeks as well, as he's lifted up. But these Pharisees, verse 19, they're hostile to Jesus. 
They didn't want to believe Jesus. They had, look back in verses 10 and 11, they had the, the chief priests on their side, which means that the, the Sadducees, chief priests were mostly Sadducees at that time. They were more of the political, uh, religious world in Jerusalem. The Pharisees were more of the people, but it's clear that they were all on the same page. Verse 10, they planned to put Lazarus to dead. Why? Because many people were going to Jesus. So we're going to kill Jesus, we're going to kill Lazarus, we're going to make nothing of this. They are hostile to Jesus. They want nothing to do with with Jesus. And for some, maybe in this room, that's you. That's you. You really don't want anything to do with Jesus. You really don't. You don't want, you don't want him in your life. Might be here because of family, guilt. But in your heart, you could say you're just as hostile as the Pharisees. Maybe that's you this morning. Or maybe verse 18, second group, the curious, I call them. The reason why the crowd, this is the next group, this is the majority of the crowd, the large crowd that come in verse 12, the reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. Many people in the crowd simply became because Jesus had performed a great sign of resurrecting Lazarus from the dead. Honestly, they didn't really care about being committed to Jesus at all. Only if they got him on his terms, which in his, their, excuse me, their terms, which on their terms was that he would free them from the Romans. If you could bring me what I need, then you've you got a place here, Jesus. You bring what I want, then we're good to go. And they were curious about Jesus. They wanted to see the great worker of miracles. And they probably would have stayed with Jesus if their terms were met. But if you read through the book of John, time and time again, you have people who are following, and I use that word following in quotes, air quotes, all of you can see, I know that, right? But they weren't actually following Jesus. As a matter of fact, John chapter 6, many of his disciples who had heard him, when they heard what he really had to say, wanted nothing to do with it. And it says in John 6 that many of his disciples left from following him because they wouldn't have Jesus on their terms. They liked that he performed miracles. They probably anticipated that he was going to confront the Romans by the end of the week. But actually, throughout the week, he's simply confronting them and the, the, the religious leaders. I think the majority probably would have fallen into that group of the curious they completely misunderstood him. I pray that that's not any of you this morning, but it wouldn't surprise me if you're here and you just want Jesus on your terms. The moment he jumps into your life and starts to confront us, we don't want him anymore. Then you have the last group, verse 17, the witnesses I call them, because that's what he calls them. Verse 17, the crowd that had been with him. So now there's a crowd and there's a crowd, right? Some of you need those like circles and circles, okay? So now we're talking the smaller circle within the bigger circle. There's part of the crowd, specific people that had been with him back in chapter 11. And they had seen what he had done with Lazarus. That's who we're talking about in verse 17. The crowd that had been with him, Jesus, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to bear Witness, they had seen what took place in chapter 11, and they bore witness about Jesus. They're the ones, in a sense, who got the rest of the crowd there because they're saying, Jesus is coming, and I was there. I saw, I'm telling you, I saw that guy walk out how, or hop out or however he came out with those tomb clothes on him. I saw this, and they bore witness to who Jesus was. Now, we don't know whether or not they were true followers of Jesus because John doesn't say. He doesn't tell us. And we know from the book of John that just believing in the signs of Jesus was not enough. We know that from John. Just on your own, look at the end of chapter 2 and you'll see that. But in the book of John... What this crowd does in verse number 17 was the natural response to anyone who truly got a glimpse of Jesus. They would then bear witness about Jesus. So in chapter 1, 
Andrew meets Jesus first. And the next thing he immediately does after he sees Jesus and understands who Jesus is, is he finds his brother Peter and tells him about Jesus. A few verses later, Jesus calls out Philip. And what does Philip do? Philip immediately goes and witnesses who Jesus is to Nathanael. In John chapter 4, what does the Samaritan woman at the well do after her interaction with Jesus? Well, it tells us in verses 28 and 29, so the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, she witnessed to Jeff. She bore witness to Jesus. Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? This is the natural response in the book of John, specifically, by the way, of anyone who truly gets a glimpse of who Jesus is. They go out and they bear witness about what they've seen. And not too long after this, Jesus will breathe on them the Holy Spirit and tell them, You are my witnesses. we truly understand the significance of Jesus, we tell others about him. We testify to who he is. So, let me ask you, do you understand who Jesus is? And secondly, then who are you in the crowd if you do? Are you the hostile, the curious, or the witnessers? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage, this I mean, we kind of just scratched the surface real quick today. So much more here, but we thank you so much. Lord Jesus Christ, I pray, Father, that we would be those who witness to his name this week. We proclaim, we take something as simple as an Easter basket, Lord. For some of us, that might be a big step, and so we'll trust you and your work of the Spirit to have the courage to hand that to our neighbors. For other of us, maybe to open our mouths for that first time. We pray, Lord, that we would be your true witnesses. If those who don't, anyone doesn't know you, that they would really, truly seek to understand, even this week, why we're celebrating what we're celebrating. We ask this.